So he's published in Science and Nature. Um, he's received several prestigious awards, including Re Smithsonian Research Awards, a Presidential Early Career Award from the White House. And he's just published a book, also the title of his seminar, uh, Spying on Whales. Uh, it's been featured on national television or radio, um, and uh, it's been shortlisted for several uh, environmental book awards. So we thought it would be a wonderful way to start off the, the uh, semester of of uh, biology seminars. Nick got his PhD from UC Berkeley and did a postdoc at uh, UBC, not far from where I am now in British Columbia. As I mentioned, he lives in University Park with his wife and kids. He's an avid hockey fan, but not a Caps fan. He's a Habs fan. I'm not sure what happened there, um, but uh, I'll stop and let Nick lead. Uh, Janet will moderate the questions. We're co-hosting today's seminar. So thank you so much, Nick, for, for talking to us today, and uh, I'll let you take it away. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Pete. Can everybody hear me okay? I guess, can you hear me? I can hear you. Got some nods. Okay, good. We're good to go here. Um, thanks so much for that introduction. I'm really happy to speak to the department. I know this is kind of a weird situation we all find ourselves in, but we'll just manage and do the best we can. Um, I still think this is pretty good. You, know, you can uh, tune into some science from the comfort uh, and confines of the indoors. So, um, like, um, as Pete said, uh, cetaceans are one of the groups that I've had the opportunity to study in my career. And um, I, part of my introduction is that uh, you probably are m more familiar with what the Smithsonian does than other audiences, uh, not the least of which is that you have a, um, former Smithsonian employee now as a faculty, faculty member, but also it's a, it's a local institution. Uh, and it shouldn't surprise anybody that it's the largest museum complex on the planet. It's got more stuff than any other museum, period. Uh, and um, most of that stuff is actually housed at the Natural History Museum. Um, Smithsonian is a constellation of different museums and research centers, a zoo. Um, and uh, people kind of uh, lose sight of that sometimes when you just hear about it in the public. You kind of think spacecraft, uh, first ladies' dresses, and uh, maybe a, a gem and mineral or two. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of material to keep track of. And that's, that forms the day-to-day the -day job that uh, many people wish they were doing right now. And uh, so it's, it's, as I'm sure what Georgetown is confronted to, is how to migrate an entire community offline and that has its own challenges. Uh, okay, so about whales. Um, we have kind of an, an unusual uh, history with this group of animals as compared with other groups. And one way that I like to think about it is using these images is kind of a, a starting point. Uh, these are golden disks that were affixed to the side of spacecraft that are now outside of our solar system. Uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which if people are familiar with, are kind of emissaries that were created uh, in the 1970s to take part of a grand tour of the solar system and gave us some of our first insights into other planets, and now of which since passed outside of the solar system. Uh, and on the side, uh, the scientists who created those uh, robot explorers put these disks that would record the images, uh, sounds, and music of our planet, of our civilization. And it's selective, and you can definitely go to YouTube and hear the whole, uh, the whole golden disks. And what this has to do with whales is that there are whale song that is um, encoded on the golden disks. And uh, that may, uh, not be so unusual to people today, but in 1972, whale song were just barely first recorded. Uh, the first science paper was actually in 1972 about them. So it was a new phenomenon. And um, that kind of natural history data actually had a large role to play in their conservation. Uh, by the end of the 20th century, whales were not just targets of industry, that is for whaling and for their meat and oil, but we saw them as um, something to protect and conserve. And so this is right around that era. Uh, and the funniest thing about this is that whale song is not part of the natural sounds of the planet. It's part of the greetings section. So if you go to YouTube and you listen to the greetings on the golden disks, 
you will hear 55 different human languages in one cetacean language. And that's got to strike anybody as being a little bit funny because it presumes a lot about what you think we might know about whale song. Uh, we know that it's complex. We know that it's information rich and dense. Um, the mathematics and the structuring is really um, uh, sophisticated and it's evolved through time. It's evolved since we first started studying it. Only male humpbacks sing as far as we know. And um, what they are saying is still a mystery. We don't know if they're talking about lunch or if they're telling us the secrets of the universe. So um, we have this funny relationship with whales that's been going on for thousands of years, ever since we first started using their resources, which were stranded on, on seashores throughout the world. Um, but this is probably a more typical image that you'd be familiar with if you page through National Geographic or other magazines. Uh, this is uh, a classic underwater shot. Uh, this is a humpback whale in Wilhelmina Bay in Antarctica. Uh, in, uh, Antarctica, it turns out, is a great place to look for whales, uh, in large part because a lot of the resources they would want are found there, especially in the austral summer. Uh, and this image actually was collected uh, seconds before this one. Uh, this is from my GoPro on the, on the boat. The person who collected the image, Carolyn Van Houten, who's now a Washington Post photographer, uh, was along on uh, this expedition to tag whales to put um, uh, a sensor that would record the movement of the animal underwater when we're not around to look for it. And what I like about this photo is it's not just a great action shot of field work uh, or here's the whale coming to the surface to spy hop and take a glance at the people looking at it. Uh, so who the observer is, is definitely a big question here. Uh, but it underscores the, the challenges of studying cetaceans um, in that 99% of their lives is spent below the surface away from us. Even if you're able to go underwater, you're still not really that close to them. And they're very large animals. They're hard to study. They're a challenge. So the logistics of asking any question, if you have a scientific question about whales, the logistics determine everything. And we'll get back to this point at the end of the talk. But I just want to frame it in that these are a really tricky group of organisms to study. You've got to ask your questions really uh, in a clever way. Um, and as a paleontologist, uh, I wrote in my book a bit more about uh, why exactly I was on, on this boat in Antarctica. Uh, and it's in large part because I think the best questions in science are really at the margins of disciplines. If you can ask a question right between disciplines, um, you're probably asking a good question that has not really been answered. And how you're able to answer that, well, that's about collaborations and, and data. Um, but as a paleontologist, you know, I think about this and I imagine what a whale watch would be like 50 million years ago, because that's the extent of, a lin of the lineage uh, for whales. We know that they go back in into geologic time that far back. So 50 million years ago, if you were on a whale watch, it wouldn't look anything like this. It would look like this. And so this is what a whale would look like some 50 million years ago. Uh, this one in particular is an artistic reconstruction of Pachycetus and, um, you know, quick, primer for Latin names, especially for fossil organisms, they tend to tell you a lot about what the animal is, where it was found, or who found it. Pakasita sounds like Pakistan, and that's because this early whale was found in what was what is today Pakistan, but formerly a deltaic environment, and part of a whole island archipelago system that extended from what's today the Mediterranean all the way through Southeast Asia out to India. Uh, 50 million years ago, that was an equatorial sea uh, and full of islands and brackish waters and deltas. So the very first whales uh, didn't have a tail fluke. They had hind limbs. They had weight-bearing hind limbs. They had weight-bearing forelimbs, you know, and didn't look overall that much different morphologically than, say, a big dog. Um, they had a, nostrils at the tip of their snout. Uh, they may have had fur even. Um, and so you probably wonder, well, what the heck makes this a whale? How do we know that this is really a whale in the first place? And that's a question for paleontologists. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, so the Smithsonian is a great place to be asking questions about the evolutionary history of marine mammals and whales in particular. And if you were, if any of us were able to go into the Natural History Museum for a tour, you could go into the Sant Ocean Hall uh, right off the National Mall and see this. This is the skeleton of Basilosaurus. 
It's a 40 million year old fossil whale. Uh, it's native to North America. It's found right in the coastal plain of the Southeast United States. Um, I hope somebody asks me in the Q&A why it's called Basilosaurus. Why does it sound like it's a dinosaur? Uh, that's a really good uh, story. Um, but just for now, know that this is kind of a whale that's caught in between um, life on land and life in the water. And that's one of the key points is that the earliest whales looked a lot like terrestrial mammals. They lived on land and they underwent this aquatic adaptation over the course of not much time. Within about 10 million years, so only about one fifth of their evolutionary history, they made a complete transition from life on land to life in the sea. And we know about that from the fossil record, from not just the skeleton of Basilosaurus, but skeletons of other near relatives. And you can see them in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, all the way back to four-legged whales, kind of like Pachycetus. In the background, there's Myocetus. Um, and so fossils are telling us something that we wouldn't otherwise know. And that's what's really important about the fossil record in these major evolutionary transitions. You're getting real data about transformations that happen over geologic time. And those are transformations that you'd otherwise have to infer if you didn't have those data. So what do those data really look like? Let's take a closer look. Because I think a lot of people are wondering, geez, what, how do you even know any of these bits of rubble? And you're forgiven for thinking that it looks like pebbles and cobbles, because I'm sure that's what it looks like to the untrained eye. And it takes years of anatomical training to be able to distinguish bone from rock. Not only do you have to know the right place to look, but you have to be able to actually have a pretty good search image. Um, but one of the key features that makes any of these critters whales and not some other mammal has to do with their cranium, specifically with structures of their ear bones. Um, and there's a key feature called the involucrum. And you can see that in the top left corner, INV, there's a little arrow on the panel that has ABC. Uh, that's a little shell-like ear bone. And that shell-like ear bone is incredibly distinctive. No other mammal on the planet has that separated out from its skull the way whales do, all living whales do. So when we find that, we immediately know this is a, an extinct lineage that finds itself clustering closer to whales than it does to any other mammal. And so this is what the evidence looks like. And it's largely been built up over the last 30 so years. And we're very fortunate that some of these skeletons are relatively complete and associated. So you know that, for example, the foot bones in the bottom right hand corner actually connect with the rest of an articulated skeleton, its owner, who in this case, if you go to the top, uh, top right corner, Myocetus had weight-bearing limbs that were kind of splayed out, almost paddle-like feet, um, but connected to a pelvis that was very lightly sutured with the rest of the vertebral column. This is again a whale in transition from life on land to life on the water. If you get that separation of the pelvic girdle from the vertebral column, you get dorsoventral flexion. And that's a key feature that allows the whole axis of the body to actually flex up and down. And that's what we see today with whales that are able to to swim and power themselves through the water. So we think these early whales probably didn't have tail flukes the way living whales did. And I'm happy to answer more about how we know when whales evolved tail flukes. Um, so where does all this fit in a family tree? And I've kind of simplified this here. Again, if you know, we can play this, this game of pretend we don't know about the fossil record and all you got is what you see in the world today. Um, we know from DNA that the closest relatives of whales among all living mammal species are hippos. And whales actually nest within a group of mammals that are all even-toed hoofed mammals, even-toed ungulates, artiodactyls. And so that's a big group. That includes basically every hoofed mammal you can imagine except for three. So that includes um, cattle, deer, sheep, pigs, camels, um, we've got a thunderstorm out over here. Um, and uh, it doesn't include horses, it doesn't include rhinos, it doesn't include tapirs. They have odd toes, we'll do odd toes. Um, but so the even-toed ungulates, those are the ones that whales are most closely related to. And of all of them, it's hippos. Uh, but, you know, look at a hippo and look at a whale, there's still a lot of differences, right? So you would have to say, given that whales nest within artiodactyls, man, there's a lot of evolutionary change that goes between whales and all their closest relatives. And that's what the fossil record shows us. We can plug in and, you know, the 
the topology, the structures that you see here on the family tree, the branches, that is largely reflecting sophisticated an analysis of uh, the morphology that we find in the fossil record. It's not always complete, but it's enough to tell us who belongs where. And the story that you get of evolutionary transformations based on that tree of relationships is profound because it shows you that the earliest whales were four-legged whales like Pachycetus. And then they undergo this transformation and it really only takes about 10 million years until you get to an animal like Basilosaurus, which has no weight bearing component to its body. That was living in the water full time. Um, so most of the evolutionary history of whales is the story of what happens in the sea, even if their early evolutionary history is super, super interesting. Uh, so I was, so again, if we were able to go back in time 50 million years ago, you might, uh, to a time called the Eocene, you might see something like this, an Eocene beach party of early whales. Uh, and this is again, paleo art. These are reconstructions based on fossil material. Um, and it, I think this image is useful because it, what it communicates is that the early part of early history of whale evolution has a lot of experimentation. And I think anybody who works in the fossil record or works on early adaptations of, uh, or early diversifications of clades gets that um, in the first stages of a, of, of a big clade, you get ecological experimentation in different directions. And that's certainly true with whales where we get uh, early whales that look like they could be familiar analogs. Some are more sea lion-like, some are more croc-like. And then you get ecological, then you get, um, uh, ecomorphs that really have no comparison today. A long-snouted otter-like uh, critter with a beaver-like tail um, in the bottom left corner. So uh, the takeaway here is that all these lineages, all these early experiments in how to be a whale did not beget anything. The only lineage that begat anything were the whales that were adapted to the water full time. And it's from them that we get the 80 species we see today, but hundreds of others that uh, we find in the fossil record for uh, a stretch of over 40 million years. So um, more to the fossil record, because that's kind of, uh, I think what people would really like to know more about. Um, a fossil record, you know, and this is something that was, has been true uh, ever since Darwin's time and before, is legendarily incomplete. You wish you got complete skeletons, but you don't, for the most part. Oh talk more about an exception in a second. But for the most part, you don't get complete skeletons. So your ability to ask a question is really predicated on how clever you can be with incomplete information. And uh, these are the hands of uh, now Dr. Carlos Pareto. He was a grad student at the time working in my lab at Smithsonian. He's now a postdoctoral fellow and assistant professor at the University of Michigan in their Society of Fellows program. Uh, we are working on a, on a paper talking about the evolution of tooth complexity in cetaceans. And so in his hands here are some 40 million years of whale evolutionary history. Teeth from whales that were not quite terrestrial ones, a little bit semi-aquatic, all the way through to the most recent examples. And uh, it's a story of simplification, um, a loss of complexity. I won't get too much into it. We can talk more about it in the Q&A. But um, what I wanna communicate with this, with this slide is that we, for many periods of time and for many places in the world, what we know about the evolutionary history of whales could be put in two handfuls or on a table. So we don't get all the information as much as we would like to. But that's not always true because sometimes you get lucky. And um, what I wanna pivot to is, is a little side story here about when you do get lucky because sometimes the fossil record does give you very complete uh, material. It gives you a snapshot. When you, get, when you get some assemblages, it actually is much more of a window into how life was in the geologic past than others. And so this is a story about a fossil whale graveyard, actually a fossil marine mammal graveyard, right off the Pan-American Highway in a remote part of Chile, uh, the Atacama Desert. And uh, I talk a bit more about this in my book and how uh, our work in the Atacama, uh, we didn't go looking for uh, a fossil whale graveyard. We were looking at something else. And we just happen to be at the right place at the right time to uh, take advantage of uh, what was a crisis and an opportunity. You know, those two things kind of go together sometimes. Uh, and what it turned out was that we were the right people at the right time 
to try to tackle this amazing site that had, that had been discovered by accident by a road construction company that was widening the Pan American Highway in this part of the Atacama. Why were they widening it? That's a story of geopolitics. The Andes Mountain has the Andes Mountain Range has some is some of the most iron rich mountains on the planet, and uh, those ore deposits are key resources that emerging economies like India and China absolutely need. So in the far background of this image, there's um, a little body of water, and that's actually the South Pacific Ocean. And from that harbor, uh, everyday giant cargo ships loaded with ore go straight across the Pacific uh, to China and India. So um, widening the highway was a necessity, an economic necessity to make room for mining equipment. And in the course of doing that, um, the company that was doing it found whale skeleton after whale skeleton. And by the time we were getting to the site, uh, a lot of the skeletons had been removed, but basically every black tarp going off sub into the southern distance, going south here, looking into the view, is another complete skeleton of a whale. In the foreground are three whales kind of overlapping each other. Just to give you an extent of how many whales there were at the site, had over 40 skeletons of whales. Uh, this is looking north at a different time of day. Uh, again, every other black tarp is another complete skeleton, just like the one in the foreground. Uh, and in the foreground, that's um, uh, Anna Valenzuela Toro, who's now a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. She's a good example of um, one of the positive outcomes of science diplomacy when you do international collaborations. Sometimes you, we were talking about this before the seminar. You're able to recruit uh, students and, and provide a, a source of mentorship. And that's one of the things I do at the Smithsonian as a research scientist is um, train the next generation of scientists. And so Anna in the foreground is a great example of someone like that uh, who first started working with our um, collaborative groups uh, when she was an undergrad. This is nearly 10 years ago. Uh, but yeah, the whale skeletons are amazingly complete. And so what gives? What's going on here? And how do we solve this question? Um, if you have your cell phone handy, this should actually work. And I'm going to try to do it with you guys. Uh, if you just go into camera mode and you um, may be able to like pick this up. Uh, I'm in battery saver. And so I'm just going to click off of that because that's what my cheapo droid does. But if you use the QR code, you should be able to capture a website link. And then that would, didn't quite work for me. Try it again. All right, there we go. So that should take you, it's gonna take a second, see how good my Wi-Fi is. Um, that should take you to a Smithsonian 3D website. It'll take a second to load, but you should see exactly what's on the screen. And I may, I'll just show you that it's um, on mine. I hope it's on yours. I know this is a little clunky. We're kind of trying to do something innovative. It does uh, work, by the way. Okay, so I got it on mine here. Um, and what I'll do is I'll do it for everybody on the screen instead of like leaning over. I'm going to go over to um, over here. I'm going to pull up actually a different model. You can go to 3d.sa.edu and I can just go over to the screen here. Start sharing again. Uh, where is my always fun to chase uh, these kinds of, okay, so here we are. Um, this is a separate skeleton. It's not actually the link I sent you. It's a different skeleton, but it's those three whales that you saw in an orientation a bit like this in one of the images. And so what we did, one of the solutions to this problem, because one, some aspect of that project that I didn't really share here, but I talked about in my book, is that we were incredibly time limited. We, um, we're faced with a challenge uh, of what, are, what kind of information are we going to extract because we had to work very quickly. We did not have that much time to extract information as skeleton after skeleton was being put in giant plaster jackets and taken off site to make room for the, the, um, the ne next lane of highway that had to go in. Um, so patrimony was being saved, but they also had to work really uh, uh, quickly and you know, if you think about the main question here, why are all these whales um, found in this one place? They're incredibly complete skeletons. I've mentioned how you don't really get this in the fossil record. Um, what's going on? Well, if you want to answer a why question, you do need data and you do need context to know what's going on. And if you lose that context, you're probably not going to be able to answer the question. 
And so what we were able to do was to bring um, 3D laser scanning to the Atacama. This is in a collaboration with the Smithsonian's Digitization Program Office, which was new at the time. It wasn't actually really a um, uh, very strongly formalized or supported program, but I was able to convince uh, the people who were working there to come with me to the Atacama, see if we could capture whatever kind of information we could from these whale skeletons. And they were able to deploy both photogrammetry and laser scanning to collect really detailed images. And uh, what's fun is that, you know, these are photorealistic 3D models that are both accurate and precise. And I'm gonna show you some really neat tools here that we've uh, generated to help measure this. So this is actually, let's see if I can do this precisely and measuring it, should be a 30 centimeter scale bar. Uh, and so that tells you the, the value down there. Nailed that pretty closely, but you can uh, actually get measurements here, and these are key inf pieces of information, which is you know how wide is the dispersal of body elements from the main axis of the body? Two hundred centimeters is much less than the total length of the skeleton here, so there was not much dispersal of the bony elements from any of the skeletons at the site from um, from where they landed. So in other words there wasn't much scavenging of the skeletons. And we kind of can expect that because there were no major land scavengers uh, at this time in South America about 9 million years ago. Um, so 9 million years ago, that wasn't too different from the world we see today, but there are some important differences uh, in terms of the, the kinds of species that we find. This whale was not a four-legged whale. It probably didn't look too different from the humpback, but um, it's with these kinds of digital tools that we're actually able to say something about, um, we're able to capture kind of bottle a moment in time in the field when we're otherwise constrained logistically and able to bring back the information to lab where we're much in a much better shape to ask questions and collect data. Um, so this, this approach to doing field work really changed a lot of the fossil work that I do. Um, uh, and actually, you know, if you look at people who are using drones today, you can collect um, photogrammetric imagery sets of environments, of objects, even species, um, especially objects in museums, uh, in this way rapidly uh, without kind of doing a heavy lift like we did here at Cerro Baena. Uh, so I'm gonna go back, you know, you can explore more of these 3D models online. And it's, it's, um, uh, it's something that, uh, like I say, has really changed the kind of research I do. Um, I'm gonna go back into my, it is here. Um, so, um, that's a quick story from, uh, from uh, taking advantage of an opportunity where we had incredibly complete skeletons of whales. And I hope in the q and I'm really going to try to make time for this. Somebody asks me about what we think was going on, uh, because it sure looks like a lot of complete skeletons that may represent some kind of stranding. And I'm happy to walk through the logic of what we think was going on with that site. Um, uh, the short, short answer is, I can walk through the logic, but we do think that um, this is representing repeated mass strandings caused in large part, most likely candidate, harmful algae blooms. So um, harmful algal blooms, HABs, are a common feature of today's ecosystems and uh, single-celled organisms will create toxins that get magnified as you go up trophic levels in a food web. And uh, whales, of course, are feeding at high trophic levels, certainly higher than, uh, in some cases, they're feeding directly off zooplankton. In other cases, uh, they might be one or two levels above that, but they're still at the top. And when you're at the top, you tend to eat the, everything that's um, been concentrated. And we know that's true for um, ecotoxicology. We're worried about heavy metals and persistent organic chemicals that, um, that seem to have uh, detrimental health effects. And this is certainly true with uh, toxins that are neurotoxins. And so we think this is a good example of harmful algal blooms leading to sudden death, not just once. One of the key features of the site is that we think there are four levels, four whale graveyards on top of each other. Same place over about 10,000 to 16,000 years, the same kind of mass catastrophic death assemblage. And again, I'm happy to walk through the logic and data uh, uh, afterwards in the Q&A uh, with more 3D models, which can be a lot of fun. Uh, but it's at this point in the talk that I think I, I want to pivot from not just being about the past to looking to the future, because a lot of the lessons that we learned from the fossil record are actually super relevant as we look ahead to the future 
of cetaceans uh, on planet Earth in the age of the humans. So, um, you know, something that um, well, we were just talking about, I can't remember if this was before the talk or uh, just at the beginning, uh, Pete mentioned blue whales. Um, so, and this is a, a wonderful image. You know, we kind of live in the golden age of, of uh, natural history videos. So if you watch any BBC film, uh, you will see images like this. And this is the kind of image that you wouldn't see necessarily before the modern era of, um, of, of just amazing natural history footage. This is a blue whale feeding off of California near Monterey Bay, coming to the end of a lunge when its mouth has since closed over a huge swarm of krill and it's beginning to filter feed. And you can see all the individual krill escaping the maw of death. Um, blue whales are renowned for being the largest whale alive today. Um, some in excess of 100 feet. You don't really see them much these days, be more than 100 feet. It's in large part because of whaling, which I'll mention in a second. But uh, the fact of the matter remains, blue whales are enormous. and They're actually heavier than any other vertebrate we know of. Uh, some dinosaurs were longer, but they weren't heavier. And when you look at all the large whales that are alive today, they all represent the largest examples of their lineage. So in a very real way, we are living in a time of giants. And I think that's the second big takeaway I would I'd encourage people to, to, to have here is that not only do whales have this 50 million year history that began uh, with terrestrial ancestors, but the whales we see today are the largest that have ever been. Uh, and that's kind of a, a funny thing because we tend to think of giants as being some aspect of the past. We think that all giants are extinct and we live in a depauperate era and that's really not the case. Um, and so if you're a biologist and you're interested in asking questions about blue whales, it's challenging. You know, the logistics are most extreme here. Uh, and I encourage you to read it. You know, there's a bunch of great papers about measuring heart rates in blue whales. That uh, was accomplished by some colleagues at Stanford University and at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, uh, great p &S paper about that. Um, so we live at these, we live in a world where we see these extremes before us. And it's a great, it's such a rich um, opportunity to ask a variety of questions in biology, whether you're interested in physiology, uh, biomechanics, um, behavior, migration, uh, there's a lot you can answer if you're able to access the data, if you can be clever about how you collect that. Um, now, of course, the, the, the big specter here about studying whales in the modern world is that we nearly uh, caused their extinction. Actually, I'm missing, I just want to pop out for a second, I think. Okay, I'll move this slide up. This is my mistake here. Um, so for blue whales, um, we nearly, we nearly don't live in a world with blue whales, and that's because we nearly caused them to go extinct through whaling. Uh, this is an image from South Georgia, which is an island between South America and South Africa. There's a kind of um, uh, back arc uh, uh, set of islands that come off the Scotia Plate that are sitting almost right in the middle of the Southern Ocean. Um, and it's on these islands that in the 1920s, seven different whaling stations um, with companies uh, uh, representing a variety of different nations, all pursued whales uh, in an industrial way, hunting them at sea and bringing them back uh, mostly for meat. It wasn't really for oil in the 20th century. And we tend to think of whaling as being kind of like a Yankee whaling 19th century phenomenon, which no doubt did a number on whale species around the world. But in the 20th century, it was really focused on the Southern Oceans. Um, and within uh, the span of 20th century whaling around the world, some two to three million whales were killed and removed from, from Earth's uh, food webs, from the ocean food, food webs. And we still don't have a good handle of the ecological ramifications this has caused. You can imagine for deep sea ecosystems that are dependent on whale fall, falling carcasses down to the seafloor, um, that may have changed things a bit especially if the carcasses are not falling to the seafloor. Uh, and I think one of these, this kind of image really communicates the scale of a blue whale. It's something you don't really get from just an underwater image. Uh, here you have a variety of men standing next to a whale that has been pulled up to a flensing deck. And uh, we do know from the length records from South Georgia in the 1920s, there were whales that were 110, 113 feet long. And we don't see whales like that today. Uh, that may be in large part because the genes for large body size have been removed from the gene pool. 
uh, and the, the decimation of, of blue whales, they nearly went extinct. Um, some 99, so 99 percent of the blue whales that, be, that were around on the planet at the start of the 20th century were no longer there by 1960. And today, blue whales are still endangered. Uh, they still haven't largely recovered from whaling in the same way that, say, humpbacks have. Humpbacks have been delisted from the Endangered Species Registry since 1994. Uh, and we're not really concerned about uh, humpbacks going extinct. But with blue whales, it certainly is a real problem. And that has a large part to do with not just their body size, but their specialization on krill. They seem to be specializing on a food source that may or may not make it through the next hundred or so years, uh, depending on how we acidify and warm the oceans. So um, not only is there a tale here of human action, but also uh, indirect influence through changing the oceans. Um, on the other, so while whaling decimated whale populations, none of these species actually went extinct from whaling. The only whale species that went extinct were um, species that had different features to their natural history. And in this case, this is the Yangtze River dolphin. Um, if you're a whale species that lives in, in uh, rivering ecosystems, that puts you in direct conflict with a lot of our species because we tend to do a number on rivers, uh, especially the Yangtze River, which was dammed up by the Three Gorges Dam. Um, and this is an image from about 1916 with a hunter, and I, I kind of go into the story in, in my book because I think it's fascinating. Um, Charles Hoy is the hunter who shot this dolphin, and it turned out to be a new species of river dolphin that had not been previously known. The specimen represented in this photo is now at the Smithsonian, and it represents the type specimen of the Yangtze River dolphin that was published in 1918. And um, it's, uh, if you work in museums, you recognize that the type specimen is something really important because it's the single individual museum specimen to which you compare everything else. Um, it helps clarify what is and isn't a given species. Uh, and in this case, the species is no longer around. We haven't heard anything of the Yangtze River dolphin since 2002. So that's less than 100 years of knowing about this species. It's been wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, and that's uh, what people call this functionally extinct. Um, it doesn't look like it's coming back anytime soon. And we know this is true for other species of whales that are um, uh, live circumscribed lives. Uh, the vaquita is another example of that, a small porpoise species that lives in the Gulf of California off of Mexico. So um, this is a story of the Anthropocene of, of whales in, on planet Earth in the age of humans. Um, oh, this is also an image of, of the last Yangtze River dolphin that lived in captivity. So, um, you know, it's not just about human hunting or the circumstances of their lives. It can also be about where whales live. And uh, here on the Eastern Seaboard, we know more about this because we see it in the news about North Atlantic right whales. This is a, an entangled North Atlantic right whale that is being freed by NOAA researchers and, and researchers at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, this is some serious cowboy stuff, um, being able to accost a large whale and free it of its entanglement is putting your life in jeopardy uh, to uh, hopefully alleviate suffering because uh, North Atlantic right whales have largely not recovered from 200 years of whaling along this coast. And right now there are some 430, 420 North Atlantic right whales. Um, that's not a very stable number when you consider that the number of breeding females is probably less than 100. And we know how many calves there are because we watch the species. In 2017, there were no new calves that season. So that's not a really sustainable trajectory for a population. And one of the serious challenges is that there's a high degree of mortality from entanglement. These are fishing lines because North Atlantic right whales feed right along urban oceans. Uh, they feed right along the eastern seaboard and their prime feeding grounds are places like Boston Harbor, which if they don't get entangled in fishing lines, puts them in direct, um, uh, in direct lines with cargo ships and cruise ships, which move much faster and are much larger than these whales. So unfortunately, there's a high mortality from ship strike or from entanglement. Um, so it's just a funny situation that some species of whales have made it through whaling when they otherwise might have not. And now the big thank you is that they get to live uh, next to a very 
urbanized and noisy and polluting the human species. So, um, you know, the decisions we make collectively as a civilization and as a nation, I'd argue, um, we hold a lot of these species, the fates of these species in our hands. And the solutions are not hard. They're largely geo geopolitical. Uh, they do take some economic um, um, considerations, but um, this is something that is workable, it's solvable. Um, so hopefully there will still be North Atlantic right whales uh, for another 150 years. I hope so at least, but it will take a different kind of understanding of, uh, of the species. And it's certainly gonna become transboundary because of climate change. North Atlantic right whales will start feeding more and more in Canadian waters. And believe it or not, the United States has much stronger laws protecting marine mammals than the Canadian government. And especially with respect to shipping lanes, North, North Atlantic right whales have ended up um, uh, dead from ship strike much more in Canadian waters than they have in American ones. So, you know, these kinds of solutions are going to take bilateralism or multilateralism, something you don't really see uh, the United States doing in the last few years. Um, and I think the last point, so we can make some room for Q and A here. Um, this, these are two humpbacks uh, back in Wilhelmina Bay in Antarctica. And uh, this is an image collected from a drone. And this may not be so strange today, but I'd say if you showed me this image when I was a grad student about 15 years ago, I would tell you this is amazing. And I still think it's amazing because there are so much data here that a grad student today is spoiled by this much information because there's so many questions you can ask, so much you can quantify and know about species that are fundamentally inaccessible and remote. Uh, these are um, humpback whales creating um, a gill uh, bubble net. And uh, what one individual whale will do is will emit a curtain of bubbles underwater and corral a school of fish while the other individual humpback goes under and rises up through that column of, of bubbles to basically feed on fish in a barrel. Uh, and that's a learned behavior. It's communicated across unrelated individuals through time and across space. Uh, so there's so much more to know about whales and uh, we are living in the golden age of knowing about them. So I think now is one of the most exciting times to be asking questions about these organisms. And that's it and I'll take um, open it up for Q&A. Great, thanks, Great. Nick. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Janet, are you going to um, take this? Sure. I mean, there were, um, a, I mean, everybody wanted to hear about the uh, stranding, well, the stranded whales in uh, Chile okay. and what the causes were um, and why, well, why you think it was um, these alto blooms. Yeah. And uh, related to that, actually, I just want to ask, was it all baleen whales that were That's stranded? Or, yeah. uh, Cause they don't, they rarely mass strand, et cetera. And yeah. anyway, so if you could talk a bit more about that. Sure. Uh, for some reason, I can't pull up the chat window. I'm not sure why I, I am not supposed to see it, but um, sure, I, I guess, um, I'll just start with, so I'll rely on you to feed me questions then, uh, Janet or Pete or someone. Okay. Just yell your, yell your questions at me. Um, so uh, for Sarah Baena, yeah, let's go back to, um, I think, you know, I think for a lot of scientific questions, there's kind of a key piece of evidence, key piece of um, information that, that is most revealing and most able to answer the questions you may have. Okay, now I see the chat. Sorry about that. Um, it's hard when you're doing anything off the laptop. So uh, this is an image of Sarah Baena. This is one I was from the slides. Um, now what's key here, if you look in the top left corner, there's a black tarp a little bit on top of that hillside. And this is really straightforward layer cake geology. That is to say there's not any major faults going through the site that would kind of misalign layers of rock. So that is real stratigraphic thickness between uh, the person in the background, his name is Roberto, um, next to uh, one whale skeleton, and then another whale skeleton about four feet above him. And it took me a while to figure it out, but there was actually four different whale bearing, whale skeleton bearing horizons at this site. Uh, so that's the first big fact about Sarah Baena. It's not just one whale graveyard, there were four on top of each other. And 
every level had the same kinds of features. That is to say, complete skeletons, some of which were piled on top of each other. Uh, they all, the complete skeletons look like big baleen whales, uh, probably rorquals or close relatives of rorquals. So close relatives of humpbacks and blue whales and uh, gray whales we think today are actually in that clade. Um, the other second fact is there's not just whales. I called it a marine mammal graveyard because uh, we found all the weird things that you find in the Miocene, uh, especially off the west coast of South America. And this is why we were there originally, which was to look for walrus whales, Otobene sea tops, and aquatic sloths. Those, none of those are, have any living descendants, uh, but they're unique to the coast of South America. And so the coast of South America, for probably the last 15 million years, is a strange ecological laboratory that has all these weird evolutionary lineages are these lineages that have evolved that we don't see anywhere else. And it's a big question about what's going on here. That's one of the reasons we were really in South America in the first place. Uh, and so it was a wonderful surprise to find these unusual taxa at the site. Uh, we found a total of about 10 different large marine species. So we found uh, seals, one of which was a new species that Anna actually described. Uh, she named it Australophoca. Uh, the southern seal, a little bit of a hat tip to Australopithecus. Um, and, uh, and there's also billfish that were found at the site. So not just air breathing vertebrates, but also gilled ones as well. Uh, and what was striking about that was that all the fossil vertebrates that we found at the site, and there weren't that many invertebrates because it was found, uh, uh, the geology represents the tidal flat. That's another clue about what's going on here. Um, all the vertebrates are top predators. They're big pelagic predators, and they're also susceptible to harmful algal blooms, all of them. So there's a range of hypotheses you can imagine that explain the site, none of which satisfy all the criteria we have. One, that there's repeated horizons having all these different species. Uh, two, they seem to be pretty intact when we find them. Sometimes we don't find all the skeleton, but when we do find the skeletons, man, it doesn't look like they've scavenged it looks like they died suddenly. And harmful algal blooms in many cases are neurotoxins. And so they do lead to asphyx asphyxiation. And if you look at the whale skeletons, you can see this one is actually oriented belly up. And so a whale that strands on a tidal flat belly up probably arrived there dead. It may have been tossed and turned by storm waves, but we have a sense of how shallow the site was based on the geology. And so we think it was actually uh, shallower than the depth of the whale, which would mean that it wasn't really tossing and turning the carcasses. They were probably died at sea and then rafted in uh, belly up. And the majority of, of complete whale skeletons are belly up at the site, which is a neat, um, uh, that's evidence that, that supports that idea. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing I would say is that if you look around at the site, you can see these orange halos. Um, we looked at that in lab and we realized that those are actually probably good examples of algal deposits. Now, is that the algae of death that killed all these whales? We don't know. But what we do know is that it's orange because of the iron oxides in them. And that iron was mobilized from runoff coming off the nearby Andes Mountains. And iron is a limiting agent for harmful algal blooms in today's world. And we know there are harmful algal blooms happening right off the coast today. Uh, along the coast of South America and everywhere else, iron is a limiting factor. So it's not so surprising to find iron washed up here because that tells us that it is at least in the marine environment and possibly fueling the harmful algal blooms that happened in the past. So that's kind of the short explanation. Yeah, it sounds like a great detective story. Um, yeah. I'm trying to go in order between people raising their hands sure. and the chat. Um, so it's gonna be Leslie, uh, Leslie Reese then Mark Rose, and then Pete Mara have questions. Okay. I also want to get the last one too. There's, there's one about um, weighing a blue whale that I definitely want to. Want to get weighing to. a blue whale. Okay. I may miss that one somewhere. It, okay. just, it just got posted. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. So Leslie, I think. Yeah. Thanks so much for a great talk. Um, I had a question. I was really struck by what seemed like a very rapid evolution and diversification from mm -hmm. land to sea uh, over a relatively short time. Um, 
And so it seemed to me that there might be some big niche that could be exploited. So I was wondering how much do we know about the other members of the community? Like I would have think there would be a lot of other top predator fish. And if we know anything about the competitors and why they were able to kind of move into that niche, like did they have any specific advantage? Yeah. Um, and then I also was gonna uh, uh, ask why that ancestor was called Basilosaurus, since you yeah. asked for us to ask it, sure. I was interested. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so oh, I'll just say, you know, the transition from land to sea, 10 million years is actually a long period of time. I know it sounds like, um, it sounds like it happened really fast relative to the entire evolutionary history of the group. But um, we evolved from a shared ancestor with chimps in less time. So, you know, evolution can happen in, in different ways, different rates for different groups. Um, and I don't think 10 million years is that crazy uh, um, by comparison with other mammals, right? Uh, and that's even true when you think about other marine mammals, too. Uh, and I'll give you a good comparison. Sea cows also have a 50 million year evolutionary history. The first sea cows were also four-legged. They weren't found in Indo-Pakistan. They were found in mm -hmm. Jamaica. And we actually have one of those on display in the, in the uh, New Deep Time Fossil Hall. Four-legged sea cow called Piso Siren. Um, and uh, what's cool about sea cows is they undergo the same uh, anatomical transformations where the pelvis decouples from the vertebral column, legs get smaller, forelimbs turn into paddles from, from weight-bearing structures, uh, nostrils migrate dorsally over the snout. Um, so it's amazing to see the, a convergence in those trajectories of adaptation to life in the water. Uh, for sea cows, it happens in about 15 million years, thereabouts. Um, I think what your question is getting at is like, well, what what were the oceans like at the time? And 15 million years ago is only about 16 million years after the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Mm. And Cretaceous ocean ecosystems were really different from the ones we see today. Uh, or former postdoc and I had a science paper where we talked about this. And what we said was that um, by and large Mesozoic uh, ocean ecosystems were hyper carnivorous. Everything was eating everything mm. else. Mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, pliosaurs, uh, 20 different lineages of reptiles adapted to life in the water. So the story of marine mammals is actually just the most recent iteration of a 250 million year story of vertebrates going back to the water and all evolving paddle-like locomotion structures, evolving snappy toothy uh, heads. And um, after the end of Cretaceous, 16 million years of no, no uh, tetrapod predator. So mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs were gone. And the only things in the ocean that were toothy were sharks. Uh, and maybe if you count uh, a sea turtle. Um, so uh, whales did have, I guess you could think of an open niche. I, uh, you know, it's, it's a useful way of thinking about it. It's not, it's hard to make that testable. Um, but I, I would say that's, that's a convenient explanation. Um, Okay, now there are so many questions that we're going to keep you here all afternoon. Um, so Mark next, then Pete, Mara, and then uh, Shweta's um, blue whale question. And there are more questions related to that. Right. And then the Bacillosaurus uh, story, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. <laughs> all right. Great. That was a great talk. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I got to say that I think that the fossil whale um, exhibit at the museum is one of my favorite parts of the museum. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so my question is, uh, one of the things I realized when you were talking is just how many different um, uh, ocean mammals have evolved independently mm -hmm. from different lineages. So, so could you say, uh, you started to talk about a little bit in terms of the sea cows, but could you talk a little bit more about dolphins and, yeah. um, and, and seals and the like? Sure. So, I mean, well, Dolphins are whales, uh, just because we give them a different group. You know, we kind of talk about them as, as if they're different, but the common names are misleading. Uh, a lot of people like to say cetaceans are whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And I just, I kind of like to, my shorthand is they're all whales. Um, some of them uh, we call dolphins, but uh, that's largely a size-based criteria. It's not really a phylogenetic one. Um, they all share a common ancestor, uh, and that's true for uh, seals, sea lions, and walruses, they're all pinnipeds, they all hang together. 
Um, so I'd say there's seven lineages of marine mammals that have evolved in different places in different times over the last 50 million years. Uh, sea cows and whales are the two oldest, but then you have pinnipeds. Then more recently you have bears. Uh, polar bears count as marine mammals. They feed on seals. They live on top of the water. It's just not to be frozen. Um, on top of frozen oceans. And um, there's sea otters as well. And then there are totally extinct groups. Uh, aquatic sloths, and then there's a, another herbivorous group called Desmostylians that have no descendants and uh, no near relatives. Completely extinct. They kind of look like marine hippos. Uh, and they got really big. They only lived in the North Pacific. Total mystery about that group. Um, so, um, marine, so this idea of mammals that have evolved aquatic lifestyles, either uh, full obligate uh, adaptations where they're not tied to land, in other cases are more semi-aquatic. I kind of think of pinnipeds as being semi-aquatic mammals. They live half their lives on land. They go feed for half the year or more in the ocean. Um, you know, these are all different examples of ways of being a marine mammal uh, that depend on your life history strategy, depend on your ancestry, uh, and depend on your ecology as it is today, uh, and the amount of time you've had to evolve. So. Mark, I, I don't know if that gives you a good- kind That was of great, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Next, um, Pete Mara's question about whale vocalizations. Do you want mm. to... Yeah, I was just curious about the, you know, I think about it from a bird perspective and how individual species of birds have, can have really diverse repertoires mm -hmm. or, or really narrow repertoires. And I'm interested in more about the function and the function of the ear bone. And if you could talk a little bit about it, that'd be great. Right, so um, so whale vocalization has- um, Kids go around like this. Uh, sorry, uh, whale vocalization happens in, in ways that we don't really understand. We don't actually understand all the anatomy responsible for vocalizing. So that's the first issue. I mean, you you get these acoustic profiles from different species. Actually, even that like mapping of acoustics to species is not that clear. Um, we have a variety of sound detection devices in the world's oceans that are hearing all kinds of weird things and we don't actually know which species they belong to. Uh, there's a lot of great um, um, natural history accounts and popular uh, pieces all about uh, weird whale noises that we have really no idea who made them. Um, so even getting that one-to-one -one, like sound and sound maker is not clear. So there's a basic natural history challenge there. Uh, there's also an anatomical challenge in that um, the two living houses of whales, the toothed whales and the baleen whales, vocalize in very different ways and different frequencies. Uh, humpback whales and the other filter feeding whales vocalize at low frequencies. They sing whale song and they hear at low frequencies. Um, how they do that probably has something, something to do with their throat apparatus. We don't know. We actually don't even know the acoustic pathway for hearing in, in filter feeding whales because it's not, they don't have an external auditory meatus that's been all plugged up. Uh, it's confluent with the rest of their skin. They don't have earlobes. So we actually don't know how so sound, the, the, the pathway of sound through the head of a filter feeding whale. We know it much better for toothed whales because they've been living in captivity for over 60 years. And um, some key experiments done in, by the Navy in the 1960s demonstrated that toothed whales are able to use sonar, high frequency sound, to navigate and also uh, different ranges and frequencies to communicate. Uh, and those, those click trains, those squeaks, and, and you've probably heard of them online. Um, that's all created by soft tissues in the forehead that are sent out uh, from that individual toothed whale out into the environment, bounce off something, and then are picked up by the lower jaw, which has a fat pad that articulates directly with the ear bones. So we know the ear bones are really important for hearing frequencies, uh, whether you're a filter feeding whale or toothed whale. Um, it, you know, that's how they hear. It's different from the sounds they make. And um, because this, the frequencies are at such different, one's infrasonic, one's at um, uh, much, you know, is ultrasonic. Um, that divergence has not really been clearly explained. And that's where paleontologists are super interested in the ear bones because they preserve really readily in the fossil record. So we are able to CT scan them and actually 
know what the hearing frequency was for a very extinct whale. And what we find is um, all, all filter feeding whales, whether they are 20 million years old or died yesterday, are hearing at low frequencies. Uh, toothed whales are all high frequency hearers, and we have yet to find uh, the origin of high frequency hearing in tooth whales. That's definitely a nature science paper waiting to happen. Um, it may be in the Smithsonian's collections. I'm you know, actively trying to figure that out. Um, it takes a lot of CT scanning a lot of time. Um, okay, we have a question from Shweta Bansal about um, yeah. how you good one, yeah. weigh a um, blue whale, but also related to that, um, Ellen Jacobs asked about um, uh, why whales have cornered the market on gigantism? Mm, um, yeah. You know, why aren't there, um, I mean, there's whale sharks and some that are much yeah. big, but n why isn't there anything as big as a blue whale in the, um, um, amongst fish or, sure. um, so, uh, yes. Okay, so first question, you know, how do you weigh a whale? Uh, they tried doing this at South Georgia. And um, obviously you need a scale to put a whale on. And that has never been done with a whole blue whale, but it has been done with a sperm whale and a minke whale. A sperm whale is about 60 feet long. And in South Africa, they pulled one, harpooned one, pulled it in full onto a nearby train tear because there was a railroad right next door. This is in Durban, uh, South Africa. And um, uh, they got a crane, picked up the whole sperm whale, put it on a train tear and got a mass, right? And then later chopped it into blocks and measured every piece in 50 kilo uh, portions. And obviously you're going to get a different value between the whole mass weigh weighing and the uh, piecemeal uh, weighing approach. And the difference should be loss of body fluid. And that's a key uh, estimate. That's a key um, kind of um, error value that has since been applied throughout the whaling industry. They did this in about the 1970s. Uh, I think it's between 10 and 12 percent. Uh, they've also done this with a minke whale, which tends to be about 30 feet long, weighs about five tons. Now, how do you do that with a blue whale? You got to use the piecemeal approach. And there's a great paper that was published in, I think it was Scientific American in 1950, by uh, um, a shipboard scientist on a Japanese whaling vessel, because the Japanese uh, after World War II, part of the conditions of reparations was that they go undertake industrial whaling, both in the North and South Pacific. Uh, and that was largely mediated by Americans. So the reason why Jap Japan has industrial whaling has a lot to do with our own geopolitics. It didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, and um, that has been done. And that is actually, in my mind, the most precise way of getting at the mass of a blue whale, chop it into 50 kilo bits, measure them all up and make sure you gather all the parts and, and weigh it together. I think the value that, that in that single um, precise way was something on the order of 280 tons. Um, so a quarter of a million um, is, pounds is, is not, uh, sorry, I think it was like 100 tons, so 250,000 um, pounds. Get my metric, my units mixed up here. Um, I, I mentioned it in my book, there's like a footnote about it. Uh, so you can go read what I, what I actually wrote down about it. Um, okay, the other questions too, oh, we'll get to Basilosaurus if there's a little bit of time. Uh, about gigantism, you know, that's a, Alan, that's a great question actually. Uh, we had a, a science paper last December with, um, that was about 30 collaborators. So some of um, the people I've collaborated most with over the last decade. Um, assembled a large data set of tag data um, that was specifically about feeding rates and the amount of energy expenditures for going after different kinds of prey items. And when you look at the differences of energy expended, energy in and energy out, it turns out that both toothed whales and baleen whales are approaching fundamental limits. Um, and that is those ecological explanations uh, are uh, those ecological limits are likely providing one of the hardest um, factors that govern body size and that prevent whales from being much larger. Your question is a little bit different because it has a broader phylogenetic scope, which is, okay, whales are big uh, as mammals and they, they're, they're, crown, they're the 
they win the championship there. Why don't we find basking sharks in elasmobranchs as large? And the answer to that is, I don't know. That is such a good question. Um, for one, um, cartilaginous fish feed in a different way. They use a different filter feeding mechanism than whales do. So it might be an efficiency thing. And also, so it's not just like the process of filter feeding, it might also be the quality of prey items. Um, whale sharks are actually feeding on different kinds of food, zooplankton, than whales are. And they might be eating less than whales are. I don't really know what the feeding rates are. So I think that there are, you know, if you got down to it, you could actually assemble the factors that um, you could, this is a very easy thing actually, is to put together a column, uh, like a uh, rows and columns of species and the factors that govern their body size. And it could be feeding rates, it could be um, basal metabolic rate, it could be um, size at birth, uh, it could be longevity too. Uh, could be um, their geographic range. There's a variety of factors that may be governing this. Um, for, I see I also mentioned about Megalodon. Um, yeah, that's a big mystery. Megalodon got really big, about 50 feet long, and then went extinct about two and a half million years ago. Um, still kind of a mystery why, why that happened. Uh, it does match very closely with the timing of the rise of body size in whales. So whales didn't get blue whale size until after Megalodon disappeared. Is that a coincidence or not? I don't know. That's still, a lot of people interpret those data differently. I kind of see it pretty secularly. Other people see it as ecological replacement. Um, I, I don't know about that. I'm not too hard on that. Um, I'm just going to say it is after 1.30, so uh, people who have to go uh, should feel free to go. We don't want to uh, keep you here. Um, people have other appointments, but um, there are some more questions, oh, and so yeah. people who can stay as long as Nick is willing to stay sure. uh, for a few more questions. Um, I think people could keep you here. Yeah. Um, until until I'll, you have I'll give five or ten more minutes, and then I actually have to um, yeah. do it. Okay. To, Okay. Um, so Basilosaurus, why is it called that? Why does it sound like a dinosaur? Uh, that's because the, the first skeletons of that uh, species that were found were found in the 1840s in Alabama and Louisiana. And the people, the naturalists, uh, this is a time when uh, natural history in the 1840s uh, was limited to uh, rich old white males. Um, and uh, the, the, the word scientists barely existed at this time. Uh, so there are people who are kind of curious about the natural world. And they found these giant bones, vertebral column of Basilosaurus. And they said, oh my gosh, this is like a sea reptile. Uh, look at these teeth, look at these bones. It must have been a king lizard. And that's what Basilosaurus means. Now, several years after its discovery, it was found by someone who's largely kind of a showman. Uh, he found the bones. He's like, oh my gosh, I can make money off this, showing it around. And put the bones on display and there's all these kinds of old fashioned newspaper accounts of the great sea reptile on display. Um, and it was formally published as Basilosaurus. So because of that, um, the accident of publication determines which name we use. Um, a few years later, those bones got in the hands of Sir Richard Owen, uh, largely you know, the best anatomist of the 19th century. Um, certainly described a lot more species than anyone else. And he knew his stuff. Uh, did not accept evolution by natural selection. Was a vehement opponent of Darwin, but a really good anatomist. And so he's one look at that skull and he said, it's not a reptile, that's a mammal. And it's not just any mammal, it's a whale. Um, and so Basilosaurus is really the first time somebody actually put two and two. It's not the first description of a fossil whale, but it's the first you know clear example of this being an extinct whale. And Owen renamed it Zuglodon, yoked tooth, because if you go back to that uh, image of the teeth in my student's hands, um, the teeth have two long roots. They kind of look like a yoke that you'd affix to an ox. Um, so Zuglodon is a name that you'll see for Basilosaurus, but it does not have priority. Uh, we play by legal games of priority in biological nomenclature. So the first published name, if it's if it's legitimate, uh, it sticks, even if it doesn't totally describe the name of the animal. So we still call this basil source. Um, all right. Uh, That's a great story. Yeah. I have one more question. 
Um, okay, well, the Abby um, Lovell asks, as a paleontologist, do you have a strong grasp of geology? How useful is firsthand knowledge as opposed to relying on your geologist colleagues? <laughs> That's a good question. So uh, I definitely rely on my geologist colleagues because I trust them to uh, know what no no geology better than I do. Um, but uh, I think that you know um, I do have some geologic training. I've done uh, plenty of field work uh, with geologists where you actually have to measure sections. So all the kind of basic functions that a geologist does, I like having somebody who you know it's kind of like. Um, It'd be uh, when we go look for fossils, everybody can participate, everybody can can um, contribute to the effort. But if you really want to make sure you know something, you may want to con consult with the expert. And so, um, again, this goes back to like good questions in science. Uh, they cut across disciplines, and that's why you need multidisciplinary teams. Uh, you can't expect one person to know it all. And your ability to be successful is really dependent on good collaboration and teamwork. So, you know, for any students that are still listening, yeah, uh, I used to hate team projects too. Group projects I hated when I was in school as well. But there's a point. One day, you may be doing team projects for real. And it may actually have a lot to do with your professional advancement and, um, you know, your desires to be successful. And so knowing how to collaborate with someone, especially if they come from a very different background, or different ex set of expert um, skills or expertise is a valuable thing. Okay, well, maybe there were some more good questions, um, but I think we are at quarter of uh, two. Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's call it. Um, so, I think right. yeah, I thank you so much. Uh, sure, no problem. Thank, thank you, you guys. So much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Everyone really enjoyed it. I'm seeing lots great. of great things on the chat and um, we'll uh, stop recording and okay. we're hoping that we can post this and maybe you can yeah. see some of the other questions. Um, <laughs> sure, absolutely. You can also harass me on social media. Sometimes I answer questions there, so. Um. Great. Okay, great. Thanks, Thank next. you so Luck much. <laughs>